the last occasion that you invited me here for a conversation at ALA. I had no sense of what to ex expect. All I was told is that uh, here on this campus, I would meet the very best leaders on the continent. And I thought, how is that possible? They're so young. But uh, after uh, being engaged and having back and forth with you all, I, I walked away feeling incredibly uh, optimistic about uh, the future, not only of uh, Africa, but the future of the globe, uh, because of the kind of uh, candor uh, that, that you guys have, the kind of vision that you have, and the kind of um, uh, muscled determination that you have to uh, leave something much better behind than the world uh, that you've inherited from the rest of us. So uh, I'm just uh, thrilled that you invited me back uh, on the occasion. I was so excited that I decided that I would bring my 13-year-old daughter, Sibel, with me because I thought that she really uh, would be inspired and motivated if she got to uh, hear and engage with you as well. Uh, and of course, uh, as we begin, I have to observe the appropriate protocol uh, and acknowledge our outstanding ambassador from Ghana. Uh, I told her as I came in that now that I know she's here, I'm a little... So the goal today is to have as much discourse as possible. So uh, last time I was here, I gave uh, a set of remarks at the, at the top that went on for, for a bit. And uh, this time we're not going to do that. We're going to open up this uh, immediately for your comments, your thoughts, your questions, your suggestions. And uh, we are determined that despite the fact that this is a mock African Union, it's going to be a diplomacy-free zone. You can ask me anything under the sun, and I'm compelled uh, to respond. And, and those of you who have come in uh, just for uh, the AU, uh, I'm uh, pleased to be able to interact with you as well. And I suspect that I'll learn so much uh, from all of you today. So as we kick this off, I'm thinking about uh, the remarks that were given uh, and the way that all of this has been framed and contextualized. And I, and I just want to suggest that for further in the past uh, of Africa's history than, uh, than at the point of the uh, creation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the African uh, Union uh, 50 years ago. I want to go even further back in the past. There's a, a, tr a tremendously important meeting that happened uh, for the history of Africa, for the future direction of Africa, that happened not in Africa, but in England, in London, England, actually it was in King's Cambridge, uh, in 1945, uh, it was a conversation that took place amongst uh, scholars and activists from throughout, the from throughout the African diaspora that really framed everything that took place in the liberation decades to come. And for me, coming and speaking to you all at ALA harkens back to that moment. In that conversation, uh, there were f phenomenal theorists and freedom fighters Again, this is in 1945, we're all gathered in the same room. People like uh, Patrice Lumumba, Jomo uh, Kenyatta, um, uh, uh, W.B. Du Bois from the States, uh, George Padmore from, uh, from Trinidad, uh, C.L.R. James, who was just an incredible historian. All of these individuals uh, were uh, joined together in this conversation to determine what uh, uh, what, must, what, need, what needed to be done in that moment and what they were prepared to commit themselves to. Uh, and for me, as I look around and we uh, begin to engage in this conversation, I'm confident that uh, the, the Lumumbas of the next generation are uh, in this room having this conversation. Uh, as, and as I think about the, the Nkuma independence uh, speech or the Nkuma inauguration speech uh, that was just cited, um, uh, you know, it reminds me of one of these seminal speeches uh, in, in African history, which was also uh, an inauguration speech, and that was at the point of uh, liberation and independence uh, for the Congo, when uh, Patrice Lumumba spoke uh, in 1960. What was, what, was the, what was the date? Does anyone remember the date? I've forgotten. It was in April of 1960. Uh, I think it was April 3rd, uh, 1960, uh, when, Lum when Lumumba sp spoke at the, at the point of of uh, the commemoration of independence from Belgium. And on that day, uh, Lumumba uh, looked out uh, at, uh, at the audience, and he looked at uh, his um, uh, the former oppressors, he looked at the, at, at the Belgians, and he said that this was a day when the Congolese would be meeting the Belgians as equals. Uh, and I think of that speech today, which was intensely radical at the time, 
but because this is a moment when Africa is meeting the world as equals. When we had our last uh, conversation, we talked about this being an important point of inflection, when Africa was uh, receiving more in foreign direct investment than in foreign aid. It means that there's a leadership opportunity that's available to all of us now, uh, and we all have to determine what our role will be and how we're gonna roll up our sleeves and, and play our part. So I could not be more excited to be here than anywhere else, uh, and I hope uh, that you all uh, will be uh, as um, brilliant uh, and as provocative as you were in our last conversation. So with that, I would really love to throw this wide open. Um, having learned from history that every um, American president felt the need to protect the interests of America, outside America, especially in the period of the Cold War, I would really like to find out from an American what exactly it is that America, why is it that America feels the need to go out there over and above to protect whatever it thinks is its interest? Thank, thank you for that wonderful, really wonderful question. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, go at it uh, from the perspective of your own sovereignty. I suspect uh, that as a Zambian, that you have the expectation that your leadership will be chiefly focused on uh, the interest of uh, the people of your republic. That as they make decisions about um, monetary policy, as they make decisions about trade and investment, as they make decisions about peace uh, and security, you would hope that they're making all of those decisions through the prism of what's best for the people of Zambia. It's only natural, it's only natural that in the 237 years of uh, our uh, um, existence as a, as a United States, that our presidents have, of course, uh, looked, acro looked up across the globe uh, through the lens of what will uh, most benefit uh, the citizens of uh, the United States. Uh, and each and every uh, president from uh, George Washington right down to Barack Obama have always attempted to put their thumb on the scale in a way uh, that's going to benefit Americans. That being said, that being said, I think that um, uh, for my generation of Americans, for my daughter's generation of Americans, we need to work in closer concert with the people of Zambia, with the people of South Africa, with people from uh, throughout the African diaspora to make a different kind of determination about what exactly is in our best interest, right? When, um, uh, I feel very comfortable having conversations here, so I, I'll say just about anything here that I would not say uh, in the outside world. Uh, there are, when, when, when I started this conversation, uh, I cited uh, the remarks uh, that uh, Patrice Lumumba gave uh, at the, in 1960 uh, at, uh, the, at the birth of, of, of the new Congo. Uh, I think that everyone here is sophisticated enough to know that um, uh, there were a lot of complicating factors in the Congo at that time, right? Lots of complicating factors, and there was all this uh, concern from international interest about uh, whether or not industry in the Congo would be expropriated and whether or not right property would be nationalized. Uh, and, I, and I believe that we all know that the intelligence community, uh, and this was at the height of the Cold War, we know that the intelligence community made decisions uh, that uh, led uh, ultimately to the death of Patrice Lumumba. Now, those decisions were made by a number of countries at that time uh, because they saw uh, the threat of expropriation as something they had to respond to in their best interest. What we need to figure out, working with one another, is uh, in, at, at this point when there's a tremendous amount of interdependence in our economies because of the way in which currency is more mobile, manufacturing is more mobile, the world uh, is, uh, you know, the, the distance between here and Washington DC has uh, shrunk uh, incredibly fast over the last few years because of uh, social networks. We have to figure out what our new, um, uh, what our new self-interests are, what our new alliances are as a result of that changing world. When Barack Obama came here uh, and uh, went to t Tanzania, uh, came here to South Africa, went to Ghana, uh, he talked about uh, the way the young people in our country have to uh, work in, in close consultation with young people throughout uh, Africa because decisions that you make here 
are going to affect outcomes uh, for on, on employment and opportunity and innovation and technology in the United States as well. So I think that um, I would say that of course our presidents have to govern themselves through the prism and through the lens of self-interest, but we all have to work together to uh, decide what the set of values are that we have in common uh, and where those uh, interests align to, to the benefit of individuals on both sides of the Atlantic. Sorry I gave you such a long-winded answer, but I hope that that was helpful. My name is Najman, I'm from Tunisia. So as a diplomat, I would love to know what is your opinion about the role of the, of the US diplomacy in, um, in helping people all around the world decide their, decide their destiny, especially that we see uprising and change in ruling systems um, along the way. Thank you, I think that that um, uh, question is a, a perfect segue from a uh, previous question about what our interests are and. Uh, and, and what de determines our, um, uh, our uh, policy um, uh, motivation. Uh, we've been very clear uh, in, over the course of uh, our, our diplomatic history and certainly over the course of the last uh, few years in particular, we've been very clear that there are a set of governing principles and values that uh, determine uh, how we traffic uh, with other countries. Uh, you ask uh, about this moment when we've seen a number of uh, democratic uprisings. Um, I, I, I'm, more, I'm more inclined not to point at the uprisings, uh, but to instead uh, point at the fact that over the last, um, uh, over the last uh, 10 years, every single year in the last 10 years, we've seen more and more elections, democratic, uh, free and fair elections being held uh, on this continent. So it's clear, it's clear that increasingly, leadership and citizenry appreciate that the uh, path to, uh, to authority, the path to uh, power uh, for individuals and, and, and for community uh, is increasingly to the ballot box uh, here in Africa. And that is, a, that is a great thing that ought to be encouraged. And if you look at the, our policies uh, over uh, the, last, um, the last few years, we have done everything that we can to help uh, resource, uh, to help elevate uh, those kinds of transformations in societies, those transitions, uh, certainly during the, the period of uprising that, uh, that, that you just uh, spoke to, which of course I'm, I'm assuming you mean the Arab Spring, right? Uh, dur dur during that period, um, uh, policy from the United States, pronouncements uh, from, from our leadership have always been uh, encouraging about the need to, uh, to, to foster uh, more and more uh, participation from civil society, more and more engagement from ind individual uh, citizens, uh, and how uh, we believe that uh, the role of a good government uh, is to uh, elevate those voices and amplify them uh, instead of uh, stomping them down and, and oppressing them. So that, that has been, I believe, a consistent theme that's come from uh, our leadership in Washington, D.C., and certainly uh, from all of our embassies uh, as well. Uh, but, but, here's the big but, uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, going back to the question from our sister from Zambia, uh, at the end of the day, uh, each and every one of our uh, governments are necessarily and naturally um, uh, going to make uh, decisions uh, determined by where, what we see as our global interests, as our uh, regional interests. Uh, and so you can believe that any president who's sitting in the White House, uh, any uh, speaker of our House of Representatives, any leader uh, in the U.S. Senate uh, is making those decisions uh, based on what they believe will be good for Americans. Fortunately or unfortunately for all of us, uh, as we look around the continent and we see incidents like what took place at the Westgate Mall, uh, and if you uh, look across the Atlantic uh, and you see what happened last year at the Boston Marathon, uh, it's clear that we have some shared interest around peace uh, and security issues, so it's incumbent upon us to work towards uh, stability uh, throughout uh, this continent, stability uh, throughout the globe. And the path to, secu to, to security, as far as we're concerned, is to increase democratization uh, and increase transparency. So that's what we try to uh, encourage as our set of values in our uh, diplomatic work. And I also, I also believe very firmly, as I approach my role, uh, that peace and security is absolutely impossible 
uh, if you uh, aren't working to resolve uh, questions of uh, economic disparities that exist in our societies. Ultimately, you cannot have peace uh, if you have uh, uh, income inequalities uh, that are as stark uh, as they are uh, in some parts of this region. My name is Vini, and I'm from Kenya. Hey. My question is basically is taking into account that you are an ambassador of U.S. to South Africa. What's a normal day of an ambassador? And do you like your job? Have you ever dreamt of becoming an ambassador? Or what was your dream before becoming before. an ambassador? And what don't you like about your job? Wow, yeah. those are fantastic questions. And I'll say that I, I really love my job anytime I get to come to ALA. So I'll start, <laughs> I'll start with, with the hot dog. Um, as, as, as far as what a typical day in my life is like, uh, there, there is no such thing as a typical day in my life. Uh, Desiree Cormier is here, who's uh, from the embassy uh, on uh, our executive staff. Uh, and uh, if she could answer for me, if, if, if Desiree read through uh, my schedule, you would think it was absolutely surreal. Uh, there are no, no two days seem to um, uh, follow logically uh, from one another. Uh, and in one moment, I could uh, be having dinner with the king of the Zulus, as I was a few nights ago. Uh, and the very next morning, I could be out in, in, uh, on, on a reserve uh, working with uh, conservationists here who are darting uh, and tracking rhinoceros to protect them uh, from, pro from poachers and tracking their DNA. So it, it varies uh, from, uh, from moment to moment. I will tell you that we have a very, very large uh, mission here in South Africa with a significant footprint. There, we, we have uh, consulates in uh, Durban, in Johannesburg, and in Cape Town, uh, as well as our embassy in Pretoria. We have close to 1,200 uh, staffers uh, who, who partner with me uh, every day to advance the bilateral relationship. Uh, and um, uh, we, we uh, spend uh, a tremendous amount of time uh, sorting through all of our interagency priorities uh, that we have here uh, in, in the region because uh, our post here in South Africa is respon has regional responsibilities beyond uh, the borders of, uh, of South Africa. Uh, I think you know that as a result of the PEPFAR program that was launched uh, uh, 10 years ago uh, in the United States. Uh, we have uh, expended billions upon billions of dollars here uh, in South Africa, in Africa, uh, writ large, to eradicate the scourge of HIV and AIDS. Uh, in South Africa alone, uh, we've invested $4 billion in the last uh, nine years uh, through PEPFAR. So you can imagine that uh, in my position, I have to spend uh, a lot of time engaging with the Ministry of Health, uh, with USAID, making certain that all of our priorities are aligned and that our resources are being used in as targeted a fashion as possible so that we can uh, have impact that can be sustained uh, beyond my tenure here in South Africa. Uh, you should know that um, uh, because uh, I have uh, decided uh, that it's terribly important that we over-engage and over-invest in the education sphere as well, that I'm spending a lot of my time trying to figure out partnerships uh, with the Ministry of uh, Basic Education and with American corporations who I think could be doing just a little bit more uh, to help on skills development uh, and, and, and transference here in South Africa. Uh, and on the question of corporations, we have over 600 uh, uh, U.S. companies that uh, have uh, post here in South Africa. Uh, and working with the United States uh, Chamber of Commerce and directly uh, with those companies, uh, we do all that we can to uh, try to create an environment that will allow them to be successful and that in turn will help them create real jobs and opportunities here in South Africa as well. So my position runs the gamut from having to uh, manage and supervise a very uh, large uh, dynamic team uh, to digging in on issues that have been really stubborn a uh, thorny uh, matrix uh, that block advancement uh, here in South Africa, but doing all that we can to kind of uh, push past uh, some of the difficulties. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you're going to be, I believe, if you're going to be, and I'm sure uh, our fine ambassador from Ghana would agree, but I think that if you're going to be an effective uh, ambassador, an effective diplomat, you can't uh, stay in the, in the lanes only of uh, 
what's considered uh, strict public policy, and I think that there needs to be cultural engagement as well. I was really proud that a few uh, days ago, in order to commemorate the 20th anniversary of, uh, of uh, democracy in South Africa, uh, we took it upon ourselves to work with the legendary, the iconic market theater to put together a production that uh, celebrated uh, the commonalities that exist between African-American culture and South African culture. And we had the, the most brilliant, and then John Connie, who I hope, I hope you, you know who John Connie is, just an important, uh, important voice in the arts here in South Africa, uh, actually an important voice globally. We worked with, with John Connie to put together this impressive production that had music and dancing and poetry. Uh, and I think that um, uh, doing that, and promoting uh, the cultural ties uh, that bind uh, our, our, our two uh, countries uh, is as important uh, as the work uh, that I'm uh, called upon to do on, on healthcare. So a day in the life is just uh, different every day and intensely colorful. The thing I like the most about my job is when I get to uh, leave uh, the embassy and go out, uh, and, and Desiree is chuckling because she knows this is a pet peeve of mine. I think that any time I'm sitting in the embassy for too many days in a row, I'm not, doing, uh, I'm not doing my job. So when I get to leave the embassy and go out and engage with South Africans, especially when I really get to go out into the community, when I go uh, to, to townships uh, and get a, a real granular sense uh, of what's uh, taking place, that's what I like the most about my job. What I don't like about my job is when Desiree comes in with a stack of papers that I have to just sit there and dutifully sign. Um, uh, but that, you know, that the last part is a joke. What I actually don't like about my job, <laughs> I'll, tell you that, I'll tell you what I don't like. That, what I really don't like about my job are, um, what's the diplomatic way of saying this? <laughs> I, think, I think that this is a remarkable country. I absolutely um, love South Africa. I think, I think, no, I think, this is one of the, I think this is one of the special places uh, on this earth. Um, uh, and I get frustrated sometimes uh, when I think that, uh, that sometimes uh, there is a uh, generation of leadership that doesn't appreciate just how much, uh, just how special this place is and how much of an opportunity they have to set a, an example uh, throughout the region, uh, throughout the continent. My name is Omar, I'm from Senegal. <laughs> and I had a question related to the practice. You're from, you're from my, the, my uh, I'm obsessed with your country. I have never been to your country. And I keep waiting for an invitation from the Senegalese. I think that your country is fascinating. Incredible uh, food, incredible music. And one of my personal heroes is, is uh, Leopold Senghor. Because I, you know, I love poetry and I love what he did in government. So, so you have to spread the word about Senegal that I'm waiting on an invitation. Exactly. <laughs> As I was saying, my question is related to practice um, versus theory. So um, I know that you've been an activist in the past and you've been involved in quite a lot of um, different movements, I would say. So um, I'd just like to know, what would you say that has clearly shaped you as being a diplomat? Is it the, the various activities you took in or just the things you learned in college or elsewhere else? It was absolutely nothing that I learned in school. <laughs> Sorry. Your question is, is exactly the same. And I believe that I uh, actually discussed this with you and kind of revealed it to you the last time uh, I was here. Uh, for me, it goes right back to my dad. My dad um, uh, was my uh, very best teacher. He was my, my role model and my inspiration. Uh, my father is somebody who uh, uh, born and raised uh, in Haiti uh, during incredibly uh, turbulent times, incredibly uh, dangerous times, uh, and he uh, spoke out against, fought against uh, the, uh, the dictatorship that existed in his country, uh, went off, uh, became a teacher in the Congo where I was born, uh, and uh, endured uh, difficulties uh, there as well in the transition from uh, Lumumba to, to Mobutu. Uh, and eventually went uh, to the United States uh, and uh, throughout uh, his entire uh, adult life, my father, uh, every single day, uh, especially as somebody who uh, struggled to raise six children uh, with very little means uh, in the richest country in the world, 
uh, somebody who had to be a diplomat every single day. He had to, he had to negotiate uh, in uh, very tough circumstances always. So he was always uh, my role model. And he always uh, inspired me uh, and helped me understand uh, that um, uh, there was an absolute umbilical cord uh, between uh, me and Africa, uh, no matter where I was, and that I needed to be uh, really uh, concerned about what took place here in the continent and to understand that I was a, a son of the soil here uh, and had to figure out some way in my life to uh, make a modest contribution. So, uh, so that's the, the answer to, to uh, both of your uh, questions. Uh, and, on, and on whether or not I wanted to be a diplomat, if you, um, if you had a conversation with me uh, when I was my daughter's age, uh, I would have uh, told you that um, uh, in my lifetime, uh, I would uh, absolutely uh, be an activist. I would be involved uh, in uh, movement uh, mobilization. Uh, that I would also be a writer because I, you know, really have a passion uh, for poetry and journalism. Uh, and I would have told you uh, that uh, I that I had a a, a, a desire uh, to one day uh, be a diplomat and to uh, work uh, through the United Nations somehow. I, I would not have told you then that I wanted to be the United States Ambassador to uh, South Africa, but I always had a sense that I wanted to be involved in international work and diplomatic engagement at some, at some point uh, when I was old. So I think I'm old enough now to do it right. <laughs> I'm Bernadetta, I'm from Tanzania. Um, you, sir, if you don't mind me saying, speak with a lot of patriotism in your words. And in my encounters with a lot of Americans, not many, but all the ones that I've met, um, they also speak in the same tone with a sense of patriotism and duty to their country. And it serves the nation rights for its people to have such patriotic attitudes. My question is, um, what does America do differently or do that um, to instill such patriotic behaviors in its citizen? Or what is it that happens there that contributes to such patriotism? Thank you for that wonderful, really wonderful question. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for recognizing the enthusiasm that I have for my country. I think um, uh, I'm, I, I'm the very first person to, uh, to talk about some of the challenges that we've had in our history, some of the challenges that we still have uh, today in the United States. Uh, but I am fiercely proud of uh, being an African-American. Uh, African-American. Uh, and uh, uh, and um, uh, I think that uh, uh, there is something uh, about uh, our uh, patriotism uh, and our enthusiasm uh, that can be a lesson for others. I had a, a conversation uh, not that long ago with a uh, fantastic South African who told me uh, that one of the things that exasperated him is uh, the fact that when uh, too many of his friends uh, talk about um, their place in this country, uh, they don't uh, identify themselves as South Africans. They identify themselves by their ethnicity first. At least that was his experience. And, and he found that to be uh, frustrating. Um, and I told him uh, that, uh, uh, that perhaps he ought to remember that his country is only 20 years old. And it took us a very, very long time uh, to fashion a deep sense of uh, national identity. Uh, I am uh, fond of uh, quoting to my South African friends uh, the example of a letter that George Washington wrote on the occasion of his uh, retirement from the presidency. Uh, after he had served, he was being encouraged to uh, serve another term, uh, and he resisted that violently and thought that it was bad for uh, our democracy if he stayed in office longer and thought that the next generation should take on the challenge. And he wrote an open letter uh, to the American people uh, explaining why he was stepping down and laying out some of the challenges. And in that letter, which he wrote in 1796, which is exactly 20 years uh, at the point of, of our inception, George Washington, in that letter, ticks off all the challenges that he sees uh, the United States has. And he warns uh, its citizens to really guard their sovereignty and to not get embroiled uh, in uh, overseas uh, excursions. Uh, and in that letter, he bemoans the fact that when he speaks to his fellow Americans, uh, they identify themselves by their states, uh, and uh, that they don't um, uh, speak forcefully about, uh, about the United States of America, but they talk about New Hampshire, they talk about Pennsylvania, they talk about uh, um, Georgia, et cetera. And 
uh, George Washington's point in that letter uh, was that the country would never really uh, live up to its potential, would not uh, see its full strength if it didn't figure out some ways uh, to coalesce around national identity. So I think that's an example to give you a sense that um, uh, the nationalistic DNA that you're picking up uh, wasn't a natural thing, but something that it had to really be worked on uh, by leadership and by the by uh, citizenry uh, over time. Uh, I can say that um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the lessons uh, that are learned, I think that in, in the states, uh, there is, we, we always have a clear sense of, uh, I, 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 in my, in, 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 uh, in where I was taught, <laughs> we always have a clear sense of the sacrifices that were made on our behalf. When you're, in, when you're a school kid in the United States, uh, you, you always hear about uh, the sacrifices of the Patriots on, in, uh, on Bunker Hill. Uh, you hear uh, over and over and over again about uh, uh, what took place at Appomattox. Uh, you hear about the, the greatest generation that gave the last full measure of themselves in uh, World War II to assure freedom not only for Americans but for the globe. So there's, a, there's a way in which we are engaged in a constant conversation uh, not only about our glory, but about the sacrifices that uh, made that glory possible. Um, uh, for me, um, uh, it, it, it can't be better said uh, than the way uh, Robert Kennedy, who I, I just love Robert Kennedy. Uh, Robert Kennedy came to South Africa in 1966, uh, and he um, uh, toured the country in defiance of the apartheid uh, regime. Uh, and he went up uh, to visit uh, with uh, Chief Lutuli uh, at Chief Lutuli's home, where Chief Lutuli had been under house arrest. He had a great conversation with him, and then afterwards he went and gave an address uh, to students here in South Africa. And at one point in that address, uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, just speaking on patriotism uh, and national identity, Robert Kennedy said, uh, he was fond of quoting the classics, uh, and at, at one point in his address, uh, he, he uh, quoted Pericles. Uh, and he said uh, to the young South Africans that um, uh, Pericles reminded Athenians that if Athens was great, that that glory was purchased by the actions of valiant men, men who knew their duty. Uh, and, and it's a simple little phrase, a little simple little statement that he had in the midst of a much longer uh, speech called the Ripple of Hope speech, which is the best speech he's ever given in his life. But as he said that to South Africans, he was trying to suggest to them that right then and there, there were men and women uh, of valor who, who knew their duty, who were prepared to act on that duty, and that needed to be recognized every day and commemorated. And that's why we really need to be hoisting up uh, the flagpoles uh, that we salute, right? We're not, we're not saluting uh, these colors, uh, we're saluting uh, the men and women of valor who sacrificed in order for these nations to be built. And I think that co that constant recollection, uh, that constant, uh, threading of a narrative about how the nation came to be and how uh, those uh, lessons continue to contribute to um, uh, what holds you together, what binds you together, uh, and what makes greatness possible in the future, I think is um, uh, a modest thing uh, that is done in the United States constantly that I think um, uh, contributes to that enthusiasm that you hear about. We all have this sense of uh, where we hearken from, even though I always like to say that Americans sometimes have uh, political amnesia. <laughs> Good evening, Ambassador. My name is Franklin Lepiampo from Kenya. And first of all, I'd just like to comment about the way you're picking people. It looks like we're going to have guys fall this side and ladies fall on the other side. <laughs> so it'd be good if maybe you pick two, a guy, a lady, a guy. Um, That's leadership. <laughs> um, during the eve of America's incursion into Iraq, there was a single, I will, I will look at um, Powell's policy and his argument at the United Nations, and they based, America most of it, based its incursion into Iraq on what has been found as one falsified testimony of an Iraqi citizen. And America went into Iraq looking for these weapons of mass destruction. This, wit this witness has since come on tape, on camera, and I remember watching the documentary and he said, he was asked, so your testimony at the UN was a lie? And he said, yes, it was a lie. And there have been reports about the United States uh, intelligence services drawing, you know, 
doing the artistic um, representations of these weapons and tanks of chemical mass destruction. So my question is, what is the moral imperative of public policy? When you're making public policy, how moral is it versus how empirical is it? I think um, I, this is beyond uh, sensitive uh, for me. I'll tell you right now that um, uh, and it's, it's, it's a matter of public record in, in the state, so I don't hesitate to say this. I, uh, as, a, as a citizen, um, I was not uh, in government at the time, but as a, a private citizen of the United States, I was um, uh, utterly opposed to our engagement uh, in Iraq and uh, found myself uh, protesting uh, at Laf inside Lafayette Park, outside of the White House, on at least three instances uh, against, uh, uh, against the, the war in Iraq. So uh, I, I, let me just uh, start from a place of telling you that I was in disagreement with, uh, with the policy uh, then and now. Uh, and, um, uh, and there were millions of Americans uh, who uh, shared uh, my perspective and my views uh, on that, including a guy who's sitting in the White House right now. Um, I, I, on, 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 your, on, on your broader question and on your point, I think it's incorrect to say that uh, the United States uh, based its decision to invade Iraq and based its uh, policy around uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, regime based on uh, the one uh, bit of flawed testimony uh, from that uh, one Iraqi citizen. I think that's, um, you'll forgive my saying, so I think that's overly simplistic. I think that um, uh, the, the evidence uh, from that gentleman uh, and the uh, uh, presentations that were made to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the National Security Council and ultimately uh, in uh, the Oval Office um, uh, were definitely impacted by uh, that kind of uh, flawed uh, information. But when you consider that we're uh, a nation that has uh, intelligence officers everywhere, that has uh, the most uh, sophisticated uh, military, that has uh, satellites that are able to uh, detect any number of things, uh, you can expect that that uh, wasn't the, in the, the principal compass uh, that led uh, to that invasion. And there were questions of uh, you know, if, um, if Don Mumsfeld were here, I'm certain that he would tell you that there were questions of uh, regional stability uh, that also uh, informed the decision making around uh, the, the invasion of Iraq. Uh, on your broader point, I think that um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to, to use uh, uh, the word uh, moral, to, to, to use the the, the, the frame of morality. I will use the, the word values. Uh, I, I think, as I, as I stated earlier, that there uh, are a set of values that, um, that we share, that are, that are common uh, amongst uh, our nations, that ought to give us uh, common purpose and common goals uh, as well. Uh, clearly, uh, the period after 9-11 uh, uh, in the United States was an incredibly uh, traumatic uh, period, uh, and I think that um, a set of uh, decisions uh, were made then that were broadly popular in the United States that are uh, as broadly uh, rejected uh, today uh, by uh, most American people because we just don't believe that it aligns uh, with the values that uh, we share uh, with others in the world, uh, with others uh, in the region. Clearly, uh, the, our, president, our current president uh, has worked uh, to draw down uh, some of these encounters and uh, to hit a reset button in the, in the region. Uh, and I think that the values that I discussed earlier uh, drive uh, that reset and will continue to drive that engagement uh, going forward. I, I think that in, in a um, uh, forum uh, that is necessarily as abbreviated as the one we're having today, it's difficult uh, to get at all the contours and the nuances of your, of your question, and I'd invite more uh, conversation on that. But um, uh, just, uh, I hope you can hear from me that um, uh, in the United States there was not a monolithic view of, uh, of uh, what the moral frame needed to be around a decision to uh, invade or not. <laughs> so I, I, um, I hope that I haven't bored you all terribly today. Uh, this was, uh, as, as before, a really great conversation uh, for me, and I appreciate it being here. But before I leave, there's something that I just absolutely have to do. There's a, uh, uh, 
there is a uh, student who I saw sitting up here earlier. Where's Gift? My Gift is on the end. Hello, Gift. Last time, last time I was here, um, uh, I had a great conversation uh, with with some of you about some of the uh, enterprises uh, that you've uh, created as a result of your uh, time here in ALA, your experience in ALA. Gift uh, talked uh, during our session about uh, the, the, the model that she created, which is focused uh, on education. And she told me that she was trying to raise resources to help a student in particular. Uh, and um, uh, she wondered whether or not I would make a contribution. Uh, and I told her uh, that if she managed to raise a certain amount of, uh, of money, uh, that I would be uh, proud uh, to contribute 100 US dollars towards uh, her, 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 her micro effort. Uh, and uh, because she's at ALA, that means that she's a gifted leader. So she, of course, uh, followed up right away. Uh, she raised uh, several hundred uh, dollars. Uh, and I, I was so excited when Desiree came to my office and said, you know, a uh, gift uh, lived up to her end of the bargain, so you're gonna have to live up to yours. So right now, from This guy's name is Benjamin Franklin, and I think he belongs to you. <laughs> Thank you all. Go on. Godspeed. Uh, lots of uh, good luck with, uh, with your uh, Model AU. I can't wait to hear about uh, the results, and I'm looking forward to sometime in the future where uh, hopefully I get to uh, engage with you again. Well, I, but this time I hope you all come down to me in Pretoria. Thank you. <laughs>